Hello, Saints. My name is Russell Sampson, and I'm reading Hiram Andrus's lecture number nine, Sons and Daughters of Christ, Doctrine of the New Birth. To begin, let's turn to this great chapter in the Book of Mormon, Alma 5. It's one of the chapters that we need to read and reread, and then read some more, and then study. It deals with one of the fundamental challenges of the gospel. Next to the understanding of Christ and the atonement, the next basic and important doctrine to understand is the doctrine of the new birth. And Alma deals with that at some length here in Alma 5. Note, for instance, here in Alma 5, verse 49, how he begins. And now I say unto you that this is the order after which I am called. Yea, to preach unto my beloved brethren. Yea, and everyone that dwelleth in the land. Yea, to preach unto all, both old and young, both bond and free. Yea, I say unto you the aged, and also the middle aged, and the rising generation. Yea, to cry unto them that they must repent and be born again. We hear this doctrine among some sectarian elements, and because they don't fully understand it, they carry it too far in the wrong direction, apply it wrongly, don't understand the full picture of it, we tend to repudiate it. But that's about the same thing that happens in the Christian world with all doctrines. They read of baptism and they end up with sprinkling and pouring and dry cleaning and call it a sacred ordinance. We shouldn't repudiate that basic doctrine. And so it is with the doctrine of rebirth. Alma's challenge, and he's not only talking to non-members in this address, he is talking to members of the church. He discusses the great spiritual awakening and the great spiritual transformation. And it wasn't just a theological filling of minds. It's a spiritual transformation, which his father, Alma, was was instrumental in bringing to pass with the people there at the Waters of Mormon. Now he is talking to them and to their children years later. As he discusses that challenge to them, then we come here to verse 14. And now behold, I ask you, my brethren of the church, Again, not the non-members in the community. I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have you spiritually been born of God? Have you received his image? And this image is his divine image, the divine nature, the spirit, glory, power, the transforming truth and energy that comes through the Holy Spirit. Have you received his image in your countenances? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Do you exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption subject to death raised in incorruption to stand before God to be judged according to the deeds which have been done in the mortal body? Is that the nature of our hope that we look at ourselves in light of our present state, however sanctimonious? We may consider ourselves to be and see that our dependence is in Christ and see the need for the mighty change, the new birth, and then view this in the light of the ultimate realization of that divine process and view this mortal body raised to immortality and this corrupt body that is subject to death, to the aches and pains and all of that raised in incorruption to be made a glorious body like unto the resurrected Christ. Is that our hope? Then he, then as he addressed members of the church further, those probably who had this kind of experience in their lives, in verse 26, he says, And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if ye have experienced a change of heart, and if ye have felt to sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask you, can you feel so now? Is that still the situation? In other words, that's the challenge and that's the circumstance. So I'd like to discuss with you to discuss with you today the various aspects of the doctrine of the new birth. Let me begin though with a clarification. The Book of Mormon centers considerable emphasis on Christ. And yet, if you read the Book of Mormon carefully, Christ in the Book of Mormon is the revelation of the Father. If you understand the doctrine of the Book of Mormon, then you understand that Christ was the way by which the Father came to earth. If you want to ponder that one a little bit, here is the man of holiness, and here are his kids down here in that fallen state. You'd like very much to go down and visit them and to teach them and to manifest your love to them and your truth and power to them. 
yet you are resurrected celestial being and how are you going to get there but there is a way the way is to beget a son in the flesh you can do things with divine processes that you can't do with mortal processes so you beget a son in the flesh and you center your divine nature in him and he becomes your son not in the flesh only but also in respect to the divine nature we'll talk about that later the divine nature relationship is such that implanted in Christ, it is like putting in him a full bloom television instrument and having another one in the Father. So as Christ walks around the earth, the Father is in him for all intents and purposes. The Father is in him and can manifest his will through him, can say to other people, I love you through him, and can teach his truth, manifest his power in healing, raising the dead, etc., so in Christ the Father dwells, and that's the way the Father immediately and personally manifests himself to his children. Christ came to earth not only in his own person and own right, he came to earth as the literal revelation and manifestation and extension of the man of holiness to men on this earth. You ask, well, what did that do to Christ's personality? What did that do to his will? What did that do to his own unique person and character? Here again, long ago, I coined this little statement. Mormonism reconciles the irreconcilable. If you think something can't be done, all things are possible to those who believe. Let me just say a word about that. In the New Testament, one of the glorious things that Jesus did was to take the whole Old Testament and reduce it down to two commandments. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, might, mind, and strength. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he said, Upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Those two commandments are a distillation of the whole prophetic mission from Genesis to Malachi. They are a distillation, the distilling of everything down to their essence of things, right down to the substance and the very essence of what the gospel law is. There is another statement, and this is in the 93rd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, which does that same thing in, re in relation to what I want to say a word about. That statement is in verse 30 of section 93, where the Lord says this, All truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it, to act for itself, as all intelligence also, Otherwise, there is no existence. Now, there's one we can all memorize and ponder over and over again. It's the distilling of the truths of eternity down to the very essence and substance of things. Existence can't be unless it is on that premise. One of the characteristics of truth is that it is independent. All truth is independent. To be independent means that it stands on its own. It doesn't need support. It stands on its own. It doesn't need commentary. It just needs to be expressed. And the same is true of intelligence. You just need to express it. And if there is not some obstruction in the mind of a person in narrowness of thought, if their hearts are open, I don't care whether you can quote it from scripture or not. If you just say it, it's a true being. The Spirit of the Lord bears witness. It stands on its own and they know it's true. Another characteristic about truth is that truth cleaves to truth. As section 88 says, light cleaves to light, truth to truth. Intelligence has a natural affinity for intelligence, and there's a free and open union. It results in what Emerson would call a union which is ideal in individualism. He knew about the ideal, but he didn't know how to get it. Joseph Smith knew how to get it. And that's the difference between Emerson and the prophet. It's ideal individualism. Truth stands on its own. It has a natural affinity, and it doesn't disrupt personality. It's independent. When the Father conceived Christ, and as it were, not only placed his physical attributes in him with those of Mary, but he also placed the divine attributes. Those divine attributes are intelligence, light, truth, these living things, 
These living things were placed in Christ on the principle that all truth is independent in the sphere in which God has placed it, as all intelligence also. Otherwise, there can be no existence. So Christ can be the perfect embodiment of the Father, and because of his love for truth, he can bring his life into full union so that Father can act through him. That union creates a situation that is ideal in individualism. Christ is still his own unique, distinct person, and yet his love for the perfect standard of truth is such that the Father can extend the Spirit to him. We can use ourselves as an example. All of us have different levels to which God can manifest his Spirit in our lives. What is the obstruction? His power to manifest or our power to receive? It's our power to receive. Jesus just opened totally and there was no obstruction. The Father implanted in him his truth, his light, his intelligence, his power. And that truth and that light and that intelligence are independent. They stand on their own. In the meantime, Jesus on his own assimilated, used, built, took that which the Father had, internalized it, and made it his own. Did it destroy Christ's personality, his individuality? Does the Holy Spirit in your life destroy your individuality, or does it fulfill? The same thing was true of the Savior. The great challenge of rebirth is to do that. When we talk about the centrality of Christ, in no way, in no way are we repudiating the identity of the Father. We are merely recognizing his appointment, and we're merely saying how important that it is to us. Because when we come to God, it's through Christ. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me, he said. When you come up to the brother of Jared level of things and begin to knock on the celestial door and it begins to open, you will see Christ and have communion with him. And when he will take you to the Father, that's the way it is. Christ in the light and the Christ is the light and the life. But rather than setting the Father aside and putting him over here, actually this is the way the Father has of coming here and manifesting himself through Christ and getting his divine attributes here and teaching us the truths of the Father. At the same time, Christ is the instrument through which that is done. And there's that close celestial union, that great rapport and that fullness of spirit that's in him. And we want to get that a little late to that into that a little later. But it's that kind of thing. My challenge is then, how do I come there so that's not my will is swallowed up in Christ and I'm not and I'm a non-entity, so I don't have a unique personality. Some people have the idea that when we finally all get the fullness in the celestial kingdom, every person will walk down the road and those we meet will be an exact duplicate of what we are. So we just tip our hat and say, hide up, hide up, hide up. That's not the way it is in the celestial kingdom. And man can have the fullness of the spirit and a fullness of glory and have his own unique and distinct personality. A woman can do the same thing. Some people have taught the idea that a woman ought to marry a man just because he's a good man. Personally, I do not believe that. I think there is a matter of personality. I think there's the matter of compatibility of character. All aside from total devotion and commitment to the gospel, I think, I think there are things that add joy and happiness and fulfillment. We're talking in this discussion this morning about how to get into this newness of life. What do we do to get into this newness of life? I just want to say, first of all, it doesn't set aside the Father. Secondly, and some people have a lot to fear on this, it does not set aside our unique personality. In fact, it's designed to enhance and increase and fulfill and blossom out everything that is unique within us. My Holy Ghost is different from your Holy Ghost. You may not know that, but it is. The person who ministers to me and who ministers to you is the same. But my Holy Ghost is different. Let me tell you what I mean. In the spectrum of power and truth that the Holy Ghost manifests way out here, some of us take portions here and portions there and kind of mix it together because we haven't the capacity to 
just get the whole and assimilate all of it. My interest is in one thing. So the gifts of the spirit that I have draw from one area over here and the gifts of the spirit that another person may be even more faithful than I would be and maybe even more devoted and even more mature might draw from over here and put the combination together. When it ends up, then I have the power of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost in me is a different composite. It's a different composite than any other person. And you can't find another man on this earth like Hiram Mandris. It can't be done. I'm just an oddball. I am my own person, and I thank the Lord for it, and it's the same as it ought to be with you. I don't ever intend to be the same. I would like to be as near like Christ as I could be. And it's my devotion day by day to walk with him and bring my life into the kind of unity where I don't want to offend him in the least degree. And when I feel just the slightest promptings of the spirit to check it and pull back and get back on solid ground and to be one with him and to walk with him and to do that on the basis that I can partake of what he has, because boy, he has a lot and it's a worthwhile project. When I was home as a kid on the farm, my dad was the president of an insurance company there in Idaho Falls, and he raised us on the farm and turned a lot of the responsibilities over to us. I learned one simple lesson from that man. He said, if you work with a person who has more than you have on a cooperative basis, you can do and get a lot more out of it than you can by doing it on your own. In the spring of one year, as we began the farm year, he said, hey, I've got to be gone a lot, and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll feed all the pigs at, that you can gather together this summer. I'll fatten them out. I was headed for agriculture. I was getting a degree in agriculture economics. He said, I'll supply the wheat and grain and that kind of stuff. All you do is run the farm, and I'll feed your pigs. He should never have said that. It's, I just about bankrupted that guy. I had a whole herd of them. I mean, a whole herd of them. I fed them, topped them out, and all of that kind of thing, and did a great job of it. In the meantime, I did something for him too, but I found that by working with him on a cooperative basis that I could do a lot more. I can do that same thing with Jesus. I can draw on his truth. He knows a lot more. I learned a long while ago that he just knows a lot more about things than I know. I got through on a few things, and boy, the guy on the other end of things, I found out just knew a lot more than I ever knew. In fact, what I knew, and even what I now know, is so trivial. It's literally so trivial in comparison that you have no reason to be egotistical. Believe me, just no reason to be egotistical. He knows all things, and I'm telling you, he knows all things. I want to be his son, and I want to go through the process of rebirth and be able to call him my father, and to draw upon what he can give me as my father. That's what I want to do. I want that kind of relationship with him. And then to know that you can't really do that unless you work through your bishop and your stake president, unless you get your home teaching done, unless you're the best kind of humble person and faithful person in that responsibility that the Lord has given you. You just can't do that on your own. It's got to be done through the Lord's processes and through his church. King Benjamin gave the people of his day a new name. If you read very carefully, there's a lot more to this whole story than we'll have time to talk about today. And there's a level of things here that I would suggest that you, if you ponder this carefully and make it part of your life, that will open up a new whole vista and a whole new level of things that you don't yet understand. Here in Mosiah 1, King Benjamin is about to retire from his responsibilities as king and priest of the Holy Order of the Nephites. They didn't have a church at this point. They had the Holy Order. We want to talk about that probably tomorrow. The Nephite version of the Holy Order. They didn't have a church, but he is transmitting the keys of the kingdom in the Holy Order, which has its center in the temple. He wants to transfer those keys to his son, Mosiah. In the process, he wants to bring his people up to a level of things, a gospel level that they hadn't yet attained. They were good people. They were good Latter-day Saints. Note what he says of them, Mosiah 1.11. 
And moreover, I shall give this people a name, that thereby they may be distinguished above all the people which the Lord God hath brought out of the land of Jerusalem. And this I do, because they have been diligent people in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Some people read the Mosiah 2 through 4 experience of King Benjamin and think he converted them to the gospel. They don't read this verse. He didn't convert them to the gospel. There wasn't a gospel conversion program. He said they have been diligent in keeping the commandments of the Lord. So these were all members of the church and they had kept the commandments and enjoyed the blessings. And now he was going to give them something that they hadn't at that time received. He's going to give them a new name. As he went through this process and he didn't do it on, its own, on his own, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and gave him the text and told him what to teach. He taught the doctrine of the fall, that the natural man is an enemy to God, has been from the fall and needs, be, needs to put off the natural man. There needs to be a transformation where the character, the nature, the personality in some measure of the person who is unregenerated is changed. And there is a new product that comes out the other end of the tunnel. This, this the angel told him. As he preached this great doctrine on the full power program of spiritual renewal, then chapter 4 of Mosiah tells us a little about the response that followed. And it says this in verse 2 of the people who were listening. And they had viewed themselves in their own carnal state. They didn't say they were all rascals. And they didn't say that they were all unconverted unbelievers. They were talking about the state in which mortality exists. And they viewed themselves in their own carnal state. And they saw themselves with a need for this transformation. And they didn't do the Ben Franklin formula, which is, I'll analyze my life and see all my weaknesses and line them up. And then I'll work on this one this day. And I'll work on that one the next day. And I'll work on that one the next day. I suggest that you be aware of your weaknesses individually and work on them and all of that but don't rely on the Ben Franklin formula. He was a great guy. He was one of the founding fathers and he has since repented and had the blessings of the gospel in the St. George temple and all that. But there is a different program. Note how they did it. They viewed themselves in their own carnal state, even less than the dust of the earth, not because of the depravity of man, but without Christ, what are we? Without this atonement, what are we? We are less than the dust of the earth. He said, and they cried aloud with one voice saying, Oh, have mercy and apply the atoning blood of Christ that we may receive forgiveness of our sins and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things who shall come down among the children of men. Now note the result when they finally really got down to the broken heart and contrite spirit and really did it. Note what happens. It came to pass that after they had spoken these words, the spirit of the Lord came upon them and they were filled with joy, having received a remission of their sins and having peace of conscience because of the exceeding faith which they had in Jesus Christ who should come. Was that just kind of an emotional experience? Well, turn over to the next chapter, Mosiah 5, where King Benjamin made some inquiries on how this Book of Mormon seminar went over with them to see how the people responded. And I'm not King Benjamin, but we have to keep you on your toes here just a little bit. They responded in answer to his inquiry with these words. And they all cried with one voice saying, Yea, but we believe all the words which thou hast spoken unto us. And also we know of their surety and truth because of the spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts, that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. There's the key to it. You don't just work on things one at a time and do the Ben Franklin formula. Be aware of that and use the Ben Franklin formula a little, but don't make that the primary objective. The primary objective is to offer a sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, to de see yourself in your own nothingness, and to see the majesty and the goodness and greatness of God, and to cry out, and this is literally a crying out, 
Cry out for mercy and for strength. Cry out for the power of the spirit of his spirit to be in you, not to swallow up your will because all truth is independent, not to destroy your unique personality and relationship, but to get mastery and to develop that composition of the Holy Ghost that you can get to become your own distinct celestial being and person. And finally, go on and get the fullness with Christ and still be still then be a distinct, unique personality. They said that this had wrought a mighty change in their hearts, that they had no more disposition to do evil. And then it goes on and says, We ourselves also, through the infinite goodness of God and the manifestations of his spirit, have great views of that which is to come, and were it expedient, we could prophesy of all things. Now they're not just cleansed, they are filled. They are not just filled with joy and happiness, they are filled with intelligence and knowledge to where they could prophesy all things. What King Benjamin, what King Benjamin did was to take a group of good, faithful Mormons in his day and then really unload the program of rebirth on them because they really hadn't been born again in the full stature. They were the most faithful people he could find, but they hadn't really come to it. We have a prophet today who has read section 84 and pondered on it for years, which says that the whole church is under condemnation. That means all of us, and believe me, that means Hiram Andrus as well as the rest of you. We are all under condemnation. And I'm not just saying that for rhetorical purposes, I am under condemnation. I admit it. You are under condemnation. Admit it. And you will be until you come to the spiritual stature that he's talking about. And then that new name, interesting, interestingly, this is really when we get, they, they really got the new name. Verse 7, and now because of the covenant, and this is King Benjamin speaking to them, which we have made, Ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name. Therefore, ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. Now they were born of God again, and they had just been faithful members before. You go back and study those chapters and see if that isn't the proper conclusion. Then you go read section 84 and listen to what our great and glorious and noble 90-year-old prophet is trying to tell us, that we are under condemnation, not because we are inactive necessarily, but we simply haven't come up to that full standard to where the Lord can give us all that the brother of Jared got. I'll give you another example. We sometimes read the episode of Enos, the hunting episode, that turned into something more than what he originally went out for. Here's the son of a prophet. His father was Jacob. This kid had to wait until he was older and mature, and finally went to the hills and finally got a testimony. Bunk, bunk. That's not the truth. That's not what the meaning of the whole thing is. Note how he begins it in verse 1. Behold, it came to pass that I, Enos, knowing my father, that he was a just man, for he taught me in his language and also in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and blessed be the name of my God for it. So he held family home evening, and he taught him. And then he goes on and says, And I will tell you of the wrestle which I had before God, before I received a remission of my sins. Now he had been baptized and gotten a remission of his sins, in a sense, but there are two kinds of remission. One is that remission of sins, when, as it were, a shield comes down and the Lord says, Okay, I accept you and I forgive you. And the legal demands in some measure are held in abeyance and are set aside, and you are free in that sense. Then there's another kind of remission, and that's here in section 19, verse 31, and let me read it to you. And of tenants thou shalt not talk, and most of us fill this podium with tenants, personal things and trivia, and things that are secondarily important. Of tenants thou shalt not talk, But thou shalt declare repentance and faith on the Savior, and remission of sins by baptism and by fire, yea, even the Holy Ghost. It's one thing for the Lord to put a shield down so the demands of justice don't bombard you any longer, and you are free and in a state of grace in that sense. And I qualify it in that sense. 
It's another thing for you to go through something like the Book of Mormon prophets taught and have an inner renovation and cleansing so that you receive a baptism of fire and you have no more disposition to sin and you are not only free legally, but you are remitted internally and made whole. Enos had the first, and then he went into the woods to hunt and was more interested in hunting for his own soul. So he kneeled down and prayed, and note what the Lord said to him, verse 8. And he said unto me, Because of thy faith in Christ, whom thou hast never before heard nor seen, what was Jacob doing in these family home evenings? Well, there's a difference between hearing and hearing whom thou hast never before heard nor seen, and many years pass away before he shall manifest himself in the flesh. Wherefore go to, thy faith hath made thee whole. What does it mean to be made whole? It means the inner transformation, the inner cleansing. It means that you are right, not just the Lord in mercy has forgiven. It means that you are right and that you have no more disposition to sin. It means that you're right in the sense that the attributes of the divine nature, you have received his image in your countenance. That's what the Book of Mormon really challenges, challenges us to come up to. And there are different levels of this kind of thing. But that is the thing that the Book of Mormon is talking about. The rebirth level. There are different levels of it. I've been born again. I've been spiritually born again. And I've had some marvelous experiences in my life. Marvelous. I asked the Lord one time if I had had this. I was interested in it because I found it in the Book of Mormon. I didn't know whether I believed it at first or not, to be honest with you, when I finally saw it. Being an independent soul, I hum hawed around and finally said, Hey, Andrus, square up to things. So I began to study and to fast and to pray and said, Lord, I want to know about this. I came out of that experience knowing this doctrine, and I also came out of that experience knowing that I didn't have it. When the prophet says we're all under condemnation, take him at face value, please. Wherever you are in your life, get the rubbish cleared away. If there are things that you need to talk about to your bishop, get them done. Get the rubbish cleared out. Get your life founded, committed, and understand the doctrine of spiritual transformation. Understand that if you come to Christ, He's not going to destroy your unique personality. He's going to fill you with his love and with his truth and with his power. And he's going to teach you by night, as night Nephi says, the visions of the night and the instructions and powers of the spirit. And you can get the spirit of enlightenment and intelligence flowing into you. And you can get it in whole words and whole sentences and whole paragraphs. If you don't, you're not really living up to the privileges that you ought to have. That's what the Book of Mormon is talking about. Benedi gives us some interest, understanding of what it means to be children of Christ. We've talked about it in Mosiah 15. I want to come back to another phrase, phase, phase of it. In Mosiah 15, we have a commentary on Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is Isaiah's great prophetic biography of Christ. It starts out with those beautiful statements in Mosiah 14.1. Yea, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor come in us. And, we will show, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not, etc. He goes on with that great prophetic biography of Christ. It doesn't mean that Christ was a wallflower. Don't ever get yourself behind that one. He wasn't a national hero in football, but he was a man among men, and people flocked to him by the powers of the spirit that were within him. He wasn't just a stay-at-home boy either who never traveled more than 30 miles from Nazareth. Don't kid yourself about that. The Father revealed to him at an early day who he was and his role as the only begotten, and that he was the creator of the earth. He was a tremendously inquisitive person, and he was a person who did the, his own thing and who was subordinate to the Father in everything. He got out and saw things and understood that this, the world, and this is what I created, 
and looked at it from that standpoint. With that kind of insight, he could say, behold the lilies of the field, and goes on with that. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet Solomon in, his, in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. He was a great lover of nature, a great ecologist. He was a person who lived life to the fullest. He was not just a standard run-of-the-mill kid. He wasn't that kind of person. He had a great personality and a great interest. Nevertheless, here in Mosiah 14, Abinadi explains that the Savior was cut off. He was cut off here in verse 7 and 8. He says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was caught off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. Christ was cut off from fulfilling the normal full measure of physical fatherhood. And that's what Abinadi is dealing with. And that's what Isaiah is dealing with. Yet when he makes his soul an offering for sin, then that changes the whole picture. Isaiah says, who shall declare his generation? His generation are his kids, his family, his posterity. He says he is cut off from the land. And who is going to declare his generation or his family? As Abinadi treats that, he has this to say, beginning with verse 8 of Mosiah 15. And thus God breaketh the bands of death, having gained the victory over death, giving the Son power to make intercession for the children of men. The Father and the Son in Christ, and giving Christ as the Son, power to make intercession. Having ascended into heaven, having the bowels of mercy, being filled with compassion towards the children of men, standing betwixt them and justice, having broken the bands of death, taken upon himself their iniquity and their transgressions, having redeemed them, and satisfied the demands of justice. Now I say unto you, who shall declare his generation? And then he answers that. He says, Behold, I say unto you, that when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He is going to see his children. At what time? When he is on the cross crying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's when he's going to see his kids. That's a little late to begin a family in one sense of the idea, in the physical sense, but that's the way Christ became the Father. He goes on and says this verse ten, in verse 10, And now what say ye, and who shall be his seed, his posterity, his children? Behold, I say unto you that whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, yea, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, I say unto you that all those who have hearkened unto their words and believed that the Lord would redeem his people and have looked forward to that day for remission of sins, I say unto you that these are his seed, or they are heirs to the king of the kingdom of God. For these are they whose sins he has borne. These are they for whom he has died to redeem them from their transgressions. And now are they not his seed? Yea, are they... Are not the pro- and are not the prophets, every one that has opened his mouth to prophesy, that has not fallen into transgression? I mean, all the holy prophets, ever since the world began, I say unto you that they are his seed. He began his family when he died on the cross. Let me give you an illustration. This ties in and relates to the doctrine of the atonement with the doctrine of the new birth. I refer now to section 34 of the DNC. This is a revelation given to a young 19-year-old boy by the name of Orson Pratt, who had just been converted by his older brother, Parley P., and immediately left everything and went to Fayette, New York, to find the prophet Joseph. When he got there, joyous that the Lord had sent a modern-day prophet, and he knew it and had a testimony of it, he inquired of him. The Lord honored Orson with a revelation through this great Latter-day Seer. Know it how it begins in verse 1. My son Orson, here is a father and son relationship. Orson is the son. My son Orson, hearken and hear 
And behold, what I, the Lord God, shall say unto you, even Jesus Christ, your Redeemer. Now who is speaking? Christ is speaking. What relationship is Orson Pratt to Christ? He is a son. What was he in pre-earth life? In pre-earth life, he was a brother, but now he has become a son. Then the Savior talks about himself and says, the light and the life of the world, and those two words, light and life, are very important. I am the light and the life of the world, a light which shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. And then he talks about his atonement and why. He says, Whoso loved the world that he gave his own life, that as many as would believe might become the sons of God. Wherefore, Orson, you are my son. Now there's symbolism there. A woman goes through travail, descends, as it were, into the realms of spiritual and mortal darkness, and pain and anguish and sorrow and despair many times, even to the point of giving life right down to the portals of death. And this she does in order to bring forth life. And our Father honors her because he says, Every baby to which you give birth I will give to you. It's yours, and if you are faithful in the divine plan, you can have that baby with you in eternity as part of your eternal family. Similarly, our Father in heaven did the same thing for Christ in relation to us. He sent his spirit children into this world under the power of the fall. And under the power of the fall, things are canceled out. First of all, a natural man, the natural man is an enemy God, and that's not a son. You strain and you sever those intimate, close father-son relationships when the son becomes an enemy. Then besides that, as Jacob says, if you were to die, there would be no resurrection. Then if your spirit goes to the spirit world, you would deteriorate spiritually and morally so that you finally end up having no more desires for righteousness than Lucifer himself. And you would be a devil and the angel of the devil for eternity. That's what happens with that first relationship, and the Father knew that. So everlasting covenant was made, and that everlasting covenant, the Father plants himself in the conception process of Christ, so that he is in Christ, and he manifests himself through Christ. Christ becomes the perfect revelation and manifestation of the Father to us. It's not that the Father is way back over there somewhere. The closest place to the Father when Jesus was walking around when Jesus was walking around on earth, was right here in him. And it was the Father, and he makes manifest himself in that sense. But then in that relationship with those powers of deity within him, that life within him, Christ made the atonement, paid the debt, went through Gethsemane, descended below all things, did something like a woman does in travail at birth, gave his life, went down to the bottom as it were, then the father said to him, okay, now everyone that you bring through the process of rebirth, I'll give to you. So in John seventeen six, Jesus speaking of his disciples says, thine they were, but thou gavest them to me. Here we have a case then with Orson Pratt. He is the son of Christ. And why did Christ make the atonement? He said, I do so, that as many as believe might become the sons of God. Wherefore, Orson, you are my son. Can you see that relationship? That doesn't disrupt the relationship with the father, but it expands it. And we need to see it in that particular sense. When Abinadi talked about rebirth and becoming the seed or posterity of Christ, he focused what he said primarily in what we call the, pre the preparatory gospel. They were the sons of Christ in that he forgave them of their sins. These are they for whose sins he has borne. That relationship goes beyond, though, and this is the point I would like to have you see. It goes beyond mere forgiveness of sins. It goes beyond the preparatory gospel to the everlasting gospel. There is a difference. The preparatory gospel is a temporary thing, just to prepare for something that is eternal. And it centers in repentance and baptism and this in association with faith in Christ, it's administered through the preaching of repentance and of baptism and the administration of the ordinance of baptism. This is a preparatory thing to bring us to the real gospel, to the everlasting gospel. 
When we get through that and finally in our lives get to the point where we cease to row with one hand and back water with the other and go around in circles in our lives and get our lives lined out totally with Christ to be one with him and cease to transgress, then eventually that preparatory program is needed no more. It is dropped away. That's why John the Baptist says in the Great Baptismal Prayer, section 13, that the Aaronic priesthood is here that the sons of Levi might make an offering in righteousness and indicates that when that offering is made, there will be a termination of the functions of the Aaronic priesthood in the celestial world. You think about that for a moment. You are a celestial person and you are perfect and all your neighbors are perfect and there is no need to teach repentance to you and there's no need to baptize you and there's no need for the preparatory gospel. Then what happens with the functions of the Aaronic priesthood? You've made the sacrifice and there's a termination. The everlasting gospel is just exactly that. It's everlasting. You never do get to the end. You never, never get to the end. Let me turn to Ether 3.14, where the brother of Jared is talking with the Lord. Here in this chapter, Jesus announces himself and his relationship to those who are born again. In verse 14, he says, Behold, I am he who is prepared from the foundation of the world to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. Now note, in me shall all mankind have life, light, and that eternally. Now how long are you going to get life through Christ? Forever and ever. Does that include after you are celestialized? Forever and ever. In me shall all mankind have life, and that eternally. Even they who shall believe on my name, and they shall become my sons and my daughters. Now focus on this statement, while that of Abinadi was on the remission of sins. These are they whose sins he has borne. The focus of this relationship of Christ's fatherhood is on what aspect of the gospel? It's on the everlasting gospel, is it not? Once when the prophet Joseph Smith went back to Washington to get redress for the saints, he had an interview with Martin Van Buren. He wasn't about to tell Martin too much about the gospel. Martin really wasn't in that class where he was interested. He was one of the great shysters we've had as a president of this country. But Martin asked the prophet, how do you Mormons differ in your belief from other people? Note very carefully the power and meaning of what the prophet said, and also the cover-up in regard to Martin. He said, we differ in mode of baptism and in the gift of the Holy Ghost. All other considerations are included in the gift of the Holy Ghost. As a classic statement, it didn't mean a thing to the guy. It didn't mean a thing to him. He got an answer and didn't know what he got. Joseph gave him one of the classic statements of this dispensation. We differ in mode of baptism and in the gift of the Holy Ghost. All other things are included in considering as being part of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Baptism is the preparatory gospel. The everlasting gospel is the power of the Holy Spirit in all the truth and the light and ordinances that open up greater spiritual power and that lead to the fullness of celestial glory and exaltation and power. And that program never ceases, never ceases. You say, oh, I wish I knew as much as someone else about the gospel and I would be satisfied. Just as soon as you got satisfied, you'd be damned. And just is no, and there is just no end to it, believe me, there is no end. I've got an ego problem, have had at least. You know, you, you kind of get, I'm doing pretty well, and I'm getting along. I think I've got the thing mastered. Then I get down and get humbled a little bit, and the Lord opens up a whole other vista of things. And I finally come down and say, Lord, I just don't know anything. Just let me be with you and let me learn. That kind of thing. You just never get to the end. And then keep in mind that the pursuit of happiness is also the happiness of pursuit. Wherever you are, the spirit of revelation makes you just as happy as though you were with the prophet, with the brethren, etc. It just fills you. Okay, with this plan of life, and I'm going to have to use the 
blackboard over here. Within this plan of life, there are three stages of human existence. I'd like to come over and use this in order to get the idea out. There are three stages of life. There's that kind of life that we call spirit life. Spirit is the spirit life is the life that you had a hundred years ago. It's the life that associated with the spirit body. The things you could do as a spirit, the kinds of powers that you could manifest, the emotions you could feel, the relationships that you could become involved in. And believe me, there was a lot more in that sphere of life than most of us think. We kind of have a celluloid view of the first estate. There's just a lot more than what we think, but there is such a thing that we call spirit life. Let's talk about genealogy. Let's put Christ over here and deal with his relationship in spirit life. Who is Christ's father in spirit life? The answer to that question that's designated by the name title Elohim. Let's get us over here and we'll just put that generic term man. Who is man's father in pre-earth life? Again, we go back to that same thing. It goes back to a father in heaven, an exalted couple who begets spirit children in the eternal covenant of marriage. That's our first estate. And there you have a relationship in some sense with Christ in the sense that we get spirit bodies from God and he did too. Sometimes we think that puts us on an equality plane there, and that is not the case. It's what I call the mixing principle. The mixing principle is this. God can't mix any more truth in my soul than I have substance to receive. I have to have something there to which it can adhere, to which it can stick. Can I put it that way? And to which it can be integrated. And if he gives me more than that, it's like pouring water on a duck's back. It runs off, and I even become condemned, and he becomes condemned because he gives me more than can stick. That's why Alma suggested that to many it is given to know the mysteries, and then they are under a strict obligation to impart only to those who are prepared. That's Alma 12, so there's that mixing principle. Prior to spirit birth, we existed in that realm that we call intelligence, or the light of truth. And there is individually individual entity there. There is cognizance. There is progress. There is law ordained. And there is an ability to acquire the spirit of the Lord and its blessings and its gifts. So there was some kind of progression there. As we came to the level of spirit birth, then there was one individual who had so developed and matured in that early primal state that when he came through the process of birth as a spirit, the father could forge into him and infuse into him and center in him all that is possible of truth and light and power and divine attributes that you can put in a newborn spirit. And there was no deficiency in that person. The father could, on the mixing principle, infuse the fullness of the spirit to that degree that the newborn spirit could receive it. And that person then had the capability to live perfectly the total commandments of the Lord. There is no deficiency in him. He didn't have one short leg or some main feature of his body that would cause him to fall on his face if he, hit, if he hits a situation. If he handles himself as he should, he can meet the challenges of life and do so with every stride on the principle of perfection and obedience. All right, but there's a bunch of the rest of us down here, and we're struggling along. We're coming along, and we've got the capability to be born as spirits. But there's a shy place here, and they're in basic substance and character. And yet, we're in a progressive situation where we can move on. So the father goes to Christ and he says, I've got a problem and I've also got an opportunity for you. My problem is if I beget any more spirit children and considering my divine justice, if they transgress, if I get any more spirit children and they, then they have deficiencies, I can't fill them with all that I have filled you with. And there are deficiencies in their lives and I turn them loose in eternity put them on a spirit world, they are going to transgress because of the deficiencies. 
And once they've transgressed my divine law, I'm going to have to cut them off because no unclean person can dwell in my presence. So I might as well not have them because they are going to go down the tube. See the problem he had? So he said, I would like then to propose something to you. You have the capability to live perfectly and you can keep all my commandments. As you do and go through the experiences of life progressing so that you expand through progression, with that capacity you have, I will give you truth upon power, truth upon truth, power, fullness upon fullness, etc. I want to rely on you, but I'd like to go ahead and beget some other spirit children down here and bring them up. What I'm proposing to you is that first of all, I will make you my lone and single heir because you are the only one who's going to live all the commandments perfectly. And I want to center my truth first of all in you as my firstborn. And then I want to extend it through you to them. Then I want you not only to be the mediator and to be the one who extends that, but I want you to pay the debt of sin for them so I won't have to kick them out. I want you to pay the debt of repentant sin. If you'll do that, I will go ahead and have them. They will be my sons and daughters, and I will fill them to the extent that they have the capacity to be filled. They can grow and develop and develop. And many of them will eventually come to the fullness, but they are going to have to have some help along the way. You're going to have to have paid you're going to have to pay the debt of repentant sin. Since you do that, and since I'm going to focus my truth and my light and glory in you from you into and from you into them, then I'm going to give them to you. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. In third Nephi nine fifteen he says, I was with the Father from the beginning. Jesus is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. All things center in him. So we have the spirit life, and he is the firstborn, and we have that distinction. He is off and running, and we need that support. That creates the basis of a father-son relationship, not just with the Father who begot us as spirits, but in relation to the divine nature, the glory, the spiritual powers of life that lead to glory and celestial life with Christ. And he begins to come in and play that role, and this by reason of the firstborn from and that heir. He begins to become our father. That spirit life. But there is a second order of things, and we call that physical life. Physical life adds to this idea of the understanding that you can't put a fullness of glory in an organized spirit. It can't be done. You can't pull a barrel of water in a bucket. It won't hold it, and you can't perfect a person as a spirit. Section 9333 says, Spirit and element inseparably connected receive a fullness of joy. Inseparable is the resurrected order of things, and it's an inseparable relationship, and you have to have that. You can't. Spirits don't beget spirit children. They can't. They don't have the powers of procreation. So the physical life is necessary. So the father is challenged with the situation. How am I going to give these spirit children physical bodies? So there's the divine program of taking us through the first estate, proving us, and that ends up in the war in heaven and all of that. And then the third part are lost. That doesn't mean a third is a fraction. It means a third part. That's a unit. It has nothing to do with fractions. It's a third part. Every time the scriptures, the scriptures speak of it, they use third part rather than the fraction idea. So there was a third part that fell, but those who, get, who kept their first estate have the opportunity to come down here and get physical bodies. In physical life, who is Christ's father? The answer is Elohim, right? He is the man of holiness, who is our father. I have to go back here to man, don't I? The person in physical life, <clears throat> Christ getting it from the Father, had planted in him not only the physical attributes, but also the divine nature. 
As we said yesterday, he was born, born again. He had the divine nature implanted in conception in him, and he had life in himself on the same principle that the Father has life in his in himself. When I get born here on earth of my father, he's a fallen being. He has the capacity through the organization of the physical nature to beget me as a physical organism, but he doesn't have the capacity to plant me in the divine nature. So in physical life, that's not the end. There are some people who stop at this. If you read the book of Moses, chapter 8, you'll find that Noah and his sons were called sons of God. Then the other people, who were unrighteous people, they are called they called them the sons of men. The sons of men are what they are. They are sons of men, and they only have what men can give them. In that sense, there is a deficiency, because the natural man doesn't have the full image and the full glory and the full life and the full dimension of life as an organized being within himself. He doesn't have that. <clears throat> so a son of man, I don't care how cute he is, you gals, and how well he can dance and what he can do on the football field. The guy is half a man. In fact, he's not even half a man. He's a third of a man. And he's not even that. He's a fourth of a man. And he's not even that. And you need to get that straight. There is life within a regenerated person that a natural man simply doesn't know anything about. If you're alive to the gospel and you awaken to the need for that kind of life, you'll find that big husky brawny football player or whatever he is simply isn't a man, however noble and honorable he may be. If he is not regenerated and born again, he doesn't have that. So you have to go through another birth. This other birth leads to eternal life. We have a nebulous concept of eternal life. We say that eternal life means God's life. And once we've said that, then we think we've answered it. It's kind of like some th- someone coming from Mars and they see something parked out front there and they say, what's that? You say, that's an automobile. They say, what's an automobile? Well, that's a car. And you think you've given them an answer. And you think you've given an answer when you say that eternal life is God's life, that doesn't give an answer. Some people are satisfied with it, but it doesn't give an answer. Let me go back and see if we can get some kind of answer. That substance that we call the spirit, this essence that emanates from God, which is his glory, his glory is intelligence, and it's light, and it's truth. That substance, which is the spirit, is life. Jesus said, the flesh profiteth nothing. And that's an interesting idea in comparison with our worship of the physical these days. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. L-I-F-E, they are life. When a person speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, there is a converting, conveying of life from the Lord through there, this way and from the Lord directly to the person who is listening. There is life, there is regeneration, there is newness, there is transforming power that's there. So the Spirit is life. It emanates from the presence of God, and it quickens and it gives life. It can't give what it doesn't have. It gives life to all things. A person who goes through the new birth process begins not just to get a remission of sins, but he begins to get that life infused within him. So Paul talks about entering into a newness of life. And Jesus said, Straight is the way, and narrow is the path that leads to life. And few there be that find it. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. When a person comes up in the resurrection, and his body is purified and perfected, and he is centered in him by this divine endowment of glorification, the fullness of the Father's glory, then he has eternal life. Eternal life and eternal lives are related, but are two separate things. Let me turn to section 88 and just show you what I mean by eternal life. Here in section 88, verse 3, the Lord promises some of the early brethren 
what we call the second comforter of promise, which is an assurance and a guarantee of their state before him and their possible state in the future, etc. He says, Wherefore I now send upon you another comforter, that it may abide in your hearts, and this is not Christ. This is something that's going to abide in your hearts. He says, even the Holy Spirit of promise, which other comforter is the same that I promised unto my disciples, as is recorded in the testimony of John. Now note what he says about this comforter. This comforter, this comforter is the promise which I give unto you of eternal life. Know how he def- note how he defines eternal life even the glory of the celestial kingdom. What's eternal life? It is to have that kind of glory that the Father and the Son had in the sacred grove. And the life, it's life and it's light and intelligence and power. It's that power that Moroni had when he visited the prophet and the whole room was like it was burning, a burning furnace. Then when Moroni completed his communication, he just pulled that light right in so that it was just centered in him, and he was as brilliant as ever. But two inches out here, it was dark. You talk about laser beams. We don't know anything about them. Then a conduit opened, and he hid the coal up in the twinkling of an eye, and he didn't slow down to that measly speed of 186,000 miles a second either. I mean, there's a lot of light that is higher in degree and power than that kind of light that we're acquainted with. And he hid to Kolob in the twinkling of an eye. And then he came on back to have that life, to have that kind of endowment, to be like Moses on the mount and use it so that you can look at the earth and see every particle of it at one time and see it distinctly and see all the inhabitants of the earth. To use that, that is what it means to have eternal life. That is what it means. When we begin to get that, then the Lord fills us with his spirit, and he can teach you more in two minutes than you can learn in a year of graduate school if the powers of the spirit flow, because they are revelatory in nature. They are life. They are intelligence. The new birth is designed to build them within us. Over here in Moses 6.59, the Lord is talking to Adam, and he's telling him, the need to teach his kids this doctrine. In verse 58, he says, Therefore I give unto you this commandment, that you teach these things freely to your children, not just once in a while. This is most stuff, most free stuff that ought to be disseminated over this podium. This doctrine of the new birth, because, the, because next to the atonement, it's the way for us to get where we ought to be. He goes on and says, Now you teach them that by reason of transgression cometh a fall, which fall bringeth death. And inasmuch as you were born into the world, this physical world of water and blood and the spirit which I have made, and so became of dust a living soul, even so ye must be born again. There is another birth to go. You had a spirit birth. You had a physical birth. And there's another birth to go. Even so, you got to be born again. And then he talks about that birth and says it's a birth of water and spirit and cleansing by the blood, even the blood of mine only begotten. And then he tells us the results of this new birth. He says, you must do this, that you might be sanctified from all sin. Now, that's how you get sanctified. That's how the people of King Benjamin did it. They cried out for mercy and they recognized that they had need for something. I don't care how much money you've got and what kind of home you've got. You've got a need for this kind of thing, this transformation. So they cried out. Then they had a transformation where they had no more disposition to sin. He says that you might be sanctified from all sin and enjoy the words of eternal life in this world. Note he doesn't say you enjoy eternal life here. You enjoy the words of eternal life. The words of eternal life are not in that book. All I have in that book is a bunch of printed symbols with a lot of my own scribbling that goes along with the the sides. Sacred notes that indicate a lot of different things that I've kind of added to it. But that's not the words of eternal life. And that's just a bunch of scribbling with print. The words of eternal life is the revelations of the spirit to your soul. 
Section 84, the Lord says, Give heed to the words of eternal life. Then he adds this statement, verse 43, And I now give unto you a commandment to beware concerning yourselves, to give diligent heed to the words of eternal life. For you shall live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. For the word of the Lord is truth, and whatsoever is truth is light. So the word of the Lord is truth, and the word of the Lord is light by extension. And whatsoever is light is spirit. So the word of the Lord is truth, light, and spirit, even the spirit of Jesus Christ. So the word of the Lord is what? It's truth, it's light, it's spirit. That is the spirit of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord then is spirit. And when you enjoy the words of eternal life, in this life, what do you enjoy? Having a Bible on your shelf and letting the dust collect? What do you enjoy? You enjoy the spirit of Christ as a revelatory power in your life. And that is the gospel. If you read 2 Corinthians 3, you'll find that Paul says that is the New Testament. The New Testament isn't in this book. The New Testament is the writing of the Lord's word on your heart, on the tabernacle of the heart. Not engraven like Moses did on the Ten Commandments, but engraven by the Spirit in its transformation in your soul. By rebirth, we come to eternal life. And who is Christ's Father then in eternal life? Again, the answer is Elohim. Where do you prove that scripturally? Section 93 tells us, and I'm running out of time here, time we're not going to have enough time. Section 93 tells us this whole thing in relation to Christ and his endowment of glory. Verse 12. <clears throat> this is John's testimony, and if you'll receive it, it's John the Baptist's testimony of Christ's. He says, I, John, bear record, verse 11, that I beheld his glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In verse 12, he says, I, John, saw that he received not of the fullness at, fir at the first. He didn't get the full glory at first, but received grace for grace. What does grace for grace mean? Grace is something that is unearned. It's divine endowment or assistance for which we do not pay an equivalent. We might merit by it by obeying the regulations the Father has set up, but we don't earn it. There is no place for the word earn in an LDS vocabulary. There simply is no place. There is place for merit, but you can earn becoming a glorified being like you can. But can you earn becoming a glorified being like our Father in heaven? What have you got to give? What do you have to start with? Can you earn a remission of personal sins? You can't. Even Jesus didn't earn anything. He received grace for grace. To receive grace for grace means that he had to give grace. And as he gave grace to others, the Father gave grace to him. Hence, he received grace for grace, or grace for the grace that he gave to others. The last great gift that he gave in giving grace to others was to give himself in the sacrifice of all that he was in his divine godhood, to give himself for the remission of sins and for the breaking of the bands of both spiritual and temporal death. Then what did the Father give him in return? And it is a giving process. You give me, I give you. It's that. The giving process the Father then gave him the fullness. It says in verse 13, and I'm going to hurry here, and he received not the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace. Grace to grace means that you're down here. You've got one gift. You give some more. You get some more. And you go to a higher level. And you turn around and give what the Lord has given you to someone else. He gives you some more and you go to a higher level. So it's a stepladder thing until, as the statement indicates, he received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until he received a fullness. There is a semicolon after the word fullness, so the sentence is complete. Read the next verse. It says this, And thus he was called the Son of God, because, and here's another way in which Christ is the Son of God, because he received not the fullness at first, he got what he got in eternal life from the Father, 
And in that relationship of receiving, Christ became the son of the man of holiness. That relationship began with his divine conception, where the divine nature was planted within him. Then, as he gave himself in service and devotion, and that's the challenge, then he grew to manhood in the relationship of the son of his father in glory. Did you catch that? He grew to divine manhood in that relationship of glory. Not just that he got his pockets up to where they were stationary physically. He grew to be the son of God fully in glory. Then he gives us the same key as being applicable to us. Then we need to see in verse 19, he says, I give unto you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship. The flip side of the coin is that if you don't know this, you really don't know how and what you worship. That's an affront to a lot of Latter-day Saints because they just don't know. Seriously, I'm not trying to be egotistical. He says, I give you these sayings that you may understand and know how to worship and know what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name and in due time receive of his fullness. The great object then is to come unto the Father in the name of Christ and get the fullness of glory. Then he says, For if you keep my commandments, and here's the basic principle, you shall receive of his fullness and be glorified in me. That is in Christ. You don't get the glory directly from the Father. Be glorified in me as I am glorified in the Father. Then he adds very significantly, Therefore I say unto you, you shall receive grace for grace. How are you going to grow in the spirit if you don't get your home teaching done right away? If you don't get it done in such a way that you minister the spirit of the Lord, how are you going to grow if you don't minister the powers? Because it's by ministering the spirit that you do that. Because when you minister the spirit, the spirit comes this way and this way. It goes as it goes through. It can't help but bless you in its passage. May the Lord bless us, I pray, in the name of Jesus' name. Amen.